Welcome to Lockout Tagout. My name is Marcus Wiesel and I will be the instructor for this Lockout Tagout course. My contact information is listed on the screen, so feel free to contact me with any questions you may have regarding the course subject matter. Let's go ahead and look at the Lockout Tagout objectives. Firstly, I would like you to understand the general steps and procedures for Lockout Tagout. Explain the Lockout Tagout standard in very general terms for controlling hazardous energy sources. I would like you to be able to discuss why controlling hazards and hazardous energy is important and understand that job specific training is almost always required for Lockout Tagout. And finally, I'd like you to be able to explain what employers must do to protect employees from Lockout Tagout hazards. What is the standard? If you are looking at the standard and you want to get more information about it, the easiest way is to type in 1910.147 into your favorite search engine. Another way is to go to www.osha.gov and find the information there. So the lockout tagout standard outlines measures for controlling hazardous energies such as those related to electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, pneumatic, chemical, thermal, and other energy sources, including a combination of what we just discussed. For example, a, a particular system may include electrical and mechanical uh, requirements for lockout tagout. Controlling hazardous energy is important for three primary reasons. First, servicing and maintaining machines creates a lot of hazards. For example, a machine may need to be lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications every so often and as a result we need to verify that a machine has been properly locked out and tagged out in order to do so. Another reason controlling hazardous energy is important is because craft workers, machine operators, and laborers are at the greatest risk. And mostly we find that compliance with the OSHA standards on lockout tagout truly do prevent injuries and fatalities. Employee training. I'd like to discuss this in more depth because although this course surveys the lockout tagout standards, no lockout tagout course can be universal. That means lockout tagout standards in general can be discussed, but nobody has machines that you have. Nobody has the same equipment that you have. So machines and equipment vary from job location to job location. And so employees that are exposed to different forms of equipment, different types of equipment, must know the ins and outs of the equipment that they're going to be working around and working on. And so all formal lockout tagout training must be job specific. Okay. Now that we've got that down, let's talk about what employees must know when they go through when they go through job specific training. Firstly, employees must know, understand, and follow the applicable provisions in the employer's hazardous energy control procedures. For example, if we are locking out a high pressure uh, pump that pumps, say, water at uh, 5,000. Uh, pounds per square inch. Employees must know how to properly relieve the pressure and bleed the lines in order to replace a leaky valve. Okay, uh, Training should cover all of the aspects of an energy control plan and in that plan it's going to outline certain types of equipment that may be serviced and maintained or even repaired from time to time and what the elements of the energy control procedure are. So some companies create what's called SOPs or standard operating procedures that give a step-by-step -step analysis or step-by-step -step procedure of what, uh, the, of what the steps are in order to accomplish that uh, particular goal. 
And finally, uh, training must cover how the OSHA standards relate to specific operations or specific work operations. Okay, so when it comes to utilizing, say, a lockbox or a tag over a lock or both, uh, we need to reference the OSHA standards to make sure that all employees understand the OSHA standards as it relates to the job site specific equipment. Moving forward, employers must do the following things whenever the lockout tagout standards apply to their industry. Firstly, they must develop, implement, and enforce an energy control program where needed. If your organization does not have an energy control program currently, but need one, uh, feel free to contact me to discuss it. Employers must require the use of locks and tags in cases where lockout tagout standards apply, and they need to ensure that new or overhauled equipment can be locked out. Uh, employers must require the use of tags where locks can't be used and require lockout tagout devices to identify employees, whether they put a picture on there or a name. Uh, somehow, uh, the lockout tagout devices need to identify who's doing the work. And finally, employers must only allow the employee who used the locker tag to remove the device. Now, there are special cases where this isn't always possible. And if you need more information on those special cases, feel free to contact me as well, and we can discuss it in more depth. What I'd like to go into next is the very general procedure in how lockout tagout is performed. Now, essentially what this procedure is, is just a very good overview of the general steps that can be utilized in order to uh, properly lock and tag out some form of equipment or a system. So the first step is to de-energize all sources of hazardous energy. That means to disconnect or shut down engines or motors to de-energize electrical circuits, to block fluid like gas or liquid flow in a hydraulic or pneumatic system, and finally to block machine parts against motion. Here you can see a lockout tagout log and what some companies require is for any authorized lockout tagout employees uh, before they do their work and uh, before they go and uh, begin the process of lockout tagout, they make a log of what they're doing, what equipment they're locking out, times, dates, and other logistical details. This is a very, very good work practice. Moving through uh, the general procedure now, we're at our second step, which is to block or dissipate stored energy where applicable. So you might, for example, discharge capacitors, release or block springs that are under compression or tension or other, some, or other kind of mechanically stored energy, vent fluids from pressure vessels, tanks, or accumulators, but never vent toxic, flammable, or explosive substances directly into the atmosphere. Please note that we have other procedures that we might have to implement for that kind of activity. The third step is to lock out and tag out all forms of hazardous energy, including electrical breaker panels, control valves, etc. The next step is to make sure that only one key exists for each assigned lock and that only the authorized employee holds the key. We then verify by test and or observation that all energy sources have been de-energized. We then inspect repair work before removing the lock and activating any equipment. And finally, the next step is going to make sure that only the authorized employee, you for example, remove your assigned lock. And then we are going to make sure that you and your coworkers are clear of the danger points before re-energizing the system. Okay. And as you can tell on this slide, there's just a uh, very general uh, do not operate tag that could be used with a picture of an employee on there, so we properly identify the employee. 
And so that is the general procedure. And what companies typically do is they start with the general procedure and they start narrowing it down to what's appropriate and then they add to that. So for example, if we're dealing with a pneumatic system, we will start with the general procedure and eliminate all of the uh, electrical requirements that we just dis that we just kind of discussed on the general procedure and then they'll add the necessary implementations and steps that are relevant to their particular equipment. And so that's a good starting point and a good review of what it means to follow a good general procedure for lockout tagout. Now I want to discuss with you quickly two types of employees under the lockout tagout system. So first we have authorized employees and secondly we have affected employees. So an authorized employee is an employee that's authorized to perform lockout tagout work and this could be a serviceman, a craftsman, somebody that maybe is a mechanic and they go in and work on equipment from time to time or do repair work. They are going to be the individuals that are actually conducting the work and have a lock or a tag or both. Affected employees are those literally affected by the lockout tagout. So if I use the equipment regularly to do my work duties and I need the equipment repaired because it broke down, I will have an authorized employee go down there that knows how to do the repair work, lock the machine out, do the repair work, and then we can bring the machine back online and myself as an affected individual, affected employee rather, uh, will then be able to use the equipment after that's completed. And so we have a process in place that definitively saves lives. And I want to make one other distinctive remark. We must be, uh, we must be very careful to ensure that communication occurs between the authorized and affected employees at all times. And so communicating what's going on, if there are any problems, and that you are going to lock out uh, a machine or bring a machine back online, uh, we, we want to communicate that as an authorized employee to those who are affected employees. Now as we gear towards wrapping up our discussion on lockout tagout, let's go over some general industry OSHA violations with respect to uh, lockout tagout. I'm just going to bring up a couple here just to, to show you. So here we have uh, basically an inappropriate lockout tagout where somebody uh, instead of locking a lever out they just put a tag on there and they kind of put um, they kind of put that there in plain view but it's still not an appropriate measure to prevent somebody from actually uh, kicking that on. And here we have a very bold individual who ignores the lockout here sign and just puts a post-it note that says do not open. Okay so this is an inappropriate means of locking out and tagging out a particular type of equipment. So I know that we were very general in this particular segment and it's meant to because again I cannot have a lockout tagout program uh, that is very general so uh, what we went over here is uh, a very good overview of the process what's required and how equipment that is germane to your company must be addressed in terms of properly locking and tagging out that equipment per the OSHA regulations that are relevant so if you have any other questions or if you need some direction on how to more effectively implement your lockout tagout program within your company, feel free to contact me. I love discussing this kind of stuff and it's, it's always interesting to learn more about the equipment that companies use uh, to conduct their everyday operations. So nonetheless, my contact information is here. If you have any questions, feel free to call or email. Have a great day.